Ilok, let us know if you can turn on the video and such. I think we had a oh, little sure. bit before. Hey, how are you? Hey, folks. Fine, thanks. It's kind of almost Vancouver weather out here. It's uh, <laughs> six degrees and sunny, so that's... Out there in your uh, Jetsons living room, right? Well, yeah. this is this this is um, this is uh, 1980s Doctor Who. Um, ah, all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Eileen, I think we can get started. All right, all right. Okay, great. Everyone settled in. Okay. So, um, and okay, Emma's taking care of the waiting room people. So I'm just going to start. So, welcome everyone to the um, School of Communication at SFU's Book and Speaker series. Today we are presenting uh, a conversation between Sun Ha Hong and, um, and Luke Stark. And uh, the, um, uh, the book is Technologies of Speculation, The Limits of Knowledge in a Data-Driven Society. Uh, and just for your information, this, um, as you saw already that popped up in the window, this, this uh, meeting has been, is being recorded. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Simon Fraser University and the Vancouver campus where Sunha is at and myself, we are both at right now, we acknowledge the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands between the Squamish, tsleil and the Musqueam nations. Um, and, um, and right now, uh, I am going to introduce our speakers and then we will, we will, um, we will have a 40 minute talk by, uh, by, by Sun Ha, and then we're gonna move to a response from Luke, and then we're gonna open up the floor to Q&A. So, Dr. Sun Ha Hong is an assistant professor in communication at Simon Fraser University, and his research asks how data-driven systems become invested with fantasies of predictivity and objectivity, and how those fantasies help entrench long-standing disparities. As well as his recently released book, Technologies of Speculation, his new projects include cultures of fact signaling in network disinformation and the moral isolation of tech platforms. And while uh, Sun Ha's book cover is monochrome, he is definitely a colorful speaker. So I'm so happy to hear him talk about his book. I've only heard the shorter versions of this talk, so I'm super excited for him to, to join us today. Uh, and our respondent, Luke Stark, is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies at the University of Western Ontario. His work interrogates the historical, social, and ethical impacts of computing and artificial intelligence technologies, particularly those mediating social and emotional expression. He completed his PhD uh, in the Department of Media, Culture and Communication at New York University in 2016 and holds an honors BA and MA in history from the University of Toronto. Prior to joining FIMS, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the Fairness, Accountability, Transparency and Ethics group at Microsoft Research in Montreal a postdoc fellow in the Department of Sociology at Dartmouth College, and a fellow and affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. So really, really great to have, you know, these two distinguished scholars in conversation today. Uh, I am going to let Sun Ha take over and, um, you know, let's all give him a round of applause. Yay. Thank you, everyone. Um, just sharing my screen, so uh, let me know if you can't see it yet. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, I'll get right into it, and I'm going to try and keep it under 40, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for Luke to, to jump in, and also for Q&A with everyone in the room. Um, so the book is, of course, called Technologies of Speculation, and I guess I can start with the obvious, um, the question being, what does that even mean? What do we even mean by that? Um, and I think, and, and by the way, as I, as I talk, if there's anything um, where, you know, I, I drop out a little bit signal wise, or if anything's unclear, please feel free to say something in chat and, and I'll try to catch it as I go. Um, and, and you can of course also wait until Q and A after as well. So technology is a speculation. Um, and for me, talking about that begins by noting that 
I mean, what we call big data and AI for me is often about how we promise certainty to each other. So at its most sweeping, um, it is this idea that the data is objective, you can rely on it. Um, the idea that our algorithms can predict criminality so you can rest assured. So it's about promising a solid ground beneath our feet so that we can confidently say, this account deserves to be banned. This person should be arrested because they will probably commit a crime in the future. I am a productive and healthy person. So here's a comment from Gary Wolf, the co-founder of the Quantify Self. Um, so the people who did Fitbit before it was cool um, and a group of people that I studied for this book, um, I'll come back to them later, but we can observe the general idea with the general attitude running through this, right? The data tells the truth. Computers lie, don't lie, people lie. Um, so there is a certain promise of certainty that is wrapped up in this kind of discourse. But of course, the technology that we actually have to live with often come far short of this promise, right? We've all learned that the last few years around facial recognition, search engines, hiring algorithms, and other forms of data-driven harms. And really what we've learned is the fact that these technologies actually extend a far longer history of disparate impact, right? We don't live in the future where our machines work like they're supposed to. We live in the meantime of the present. The meantime of the present is where Mark Zuckerberg just says, I need to learn from my mistakes and I need to do better. And he says that for about the 80th time for 10 years running. It is a present where our cutting edge facial recognition systems still can't do the basic job of recognizing black faces properly. And instead of not using these technologies, what we do is we use them. And then things like this happen where an innocent black man gets arrested in front of his family and then he has to fight up a hill against an algorithmic result that is presumed to be more true. So the book is about coming into this debate and arguing that the real consequences of technology are found not in the projection of what is supposed to happen when it finally works, but all of the abuses and shortcuts and improvisations that occur in the meantime. And in particular, um, when technology is speculation, what I try to do is highlight how the people and institutions that use and rely on these technologies end up filling the gaps, the gap between what the technology is meant to do and what it doesn't do, filling these gaps with speculative forms of fact making. This is where people are often taking incomplete data, flawed models and unverifiable predictions and endowing them with a sense of certainty and objectivity, which leads us into trouble. Because a lot of the time, it's not the machines that are adapting to understand us better. It is us who are asked to adapt to them, their ways of seeing. It is us who are being asked to live our lives in ways that are more legible to the databases around us. So in the book, I do this by tracing several layers of such speculation. I'm following places where what we know through data and what we know about the data becomes a conduit for uncertainty um, and speculation as much as objective truth. We can think about the Snowden affair, for example, as a landmark moment. Um, and, and, I, and so in the book, I talk about how, I mean, Snowden himself comes out and says, look, I wanna give you this information about NSA surveillance and about other forms of electronic dragnet state surveillance to the people so that they can decide for themselves. So he's going back to this long treasured idea that we have of ourselves as good liberal subjects. This idea that we are like little rational information processing machines that um, cybernetically speaking, that we're kind of analogous to the machines around us. Um, and that this idea that we're going to ingest this new information about government surveillance and figure out the most rational decision about what to do. So some hope for that is, is what is underlying this kind of discussion. But one of the historical lessons of the Snowden affair over the last seven years, eight years, is that often information compels speculation, right? If for anybody who's a non-expert and for experts really, looking at the Snowden files is a little bit like reading chicken entrails, right? Making the information available doesn't guarantee meaningful transparency. So for example, one of the most morally contentious and consequential issues around the surveillance was how, to, to what extent are these programs impacting Americans rather than just foreigners? And, and that 
you know, that was one of the most contentious questions. Um, and the problem is that many of these systems ha have no ability to distinguish between Americans and foreigners at a technical level. There, there's no such thing as like a citizenship tick box in the data, right? So if we look at something like the NSA's collection of email, the collection technology targets what they call selectors. And these things are usually pretty familiar things. It tends to be email addresses or IP addresses. But for example, email addresses can be used by multiple people. People travel and then use their email when they're outside the country. A uh, domestic quote unquote email from Arizona to Miami can send packets over the Atlantic and back. So this is just a simple example of how many of these databases are organizing human beings into information in ways that run against the grain of how we know ourselves and each other, right? And we saw some of those conflicts when the NSA was forced to make this argument to the public trying to say, look, this is how it works and we don't actually have this kind of uh, uh, iron uh, uh, iron tight um, conception of citizenship to begin with in our system, right? So in the book, I talk about this as a problem of recessive object, um, this idea of something that recedes over the horizon. This is where we get the terms of service, we get the big inside scoop about Facebook, we get what we call the raw data. And the idea is that we can use such evidence to truly know the technologies around us and make decisions. But what they also do is they recede over the horizon. They force us to confront all of the limits and uncertainties about what we cannot know through this data and what we can't even know about the data. The Snowden files, of course, did generate greater public awareness about government surveillance. It is part of the broader cultural history that leads to where we are today in terms of the relatively widespread suspicion of technological claims. But it also fueled a ton of misinformation and speculation, right? There were so many ideas about how Snowden was a double agent, triple agent, Glenn Greenwald was the agent, his girlfriend was the agent. And at one point, I mean, there was an Iranian paper that said Snowden proved ISIS was created by the United States um, as, as like a manufactured uh, a plot. And of course, such Snowden never claimed such a thing, right? So a lot of these conspiracy theories, of course, were tapping into older Cold War tropes in the same way that a lot of deep state theories do today. That's not to say that Snowden caused this kind of misinformation, of course. Rather, the point is that when these data-driven systems are deliberately created to be technologically, institutionally opaque, whether in terms of the software and the documentation or in terms of the actual material infrastructure that stretches around the globe, that really challenges and undermines this expectation that we're supposed to have these informed opinions about them and we're supposed to do things like informed choice and informed consent. And so that's why in the book, and, and I actually expand this on a piece that came out last week, um, the argument that I make is that it's really risky to continue relying on longstanding correctives like transparency or privacy. It's not that they're bad, it's not that we don't need them, it's that they're often insufficient. Um, when we talk about transparency as a way to reverse the harms of opaque data-driven systems, the risk is that we fall back on those same set of assumptions about the good liberal subject that is supposed to then act on this information and has the power to act on this information. A lot of this, of course, parallels what we have seen in the last few years in, in terms of the mainstream media's role, right? Whitney Phillips calls it the oxygen of amplification, where if you keep covering QAnon and anti-vax theory, if you keep interviewing the leader of the Proud Boys as the CNN just did, you're giving them the attention that they crave and you're helping their strategy because you're giving them a crucial route into recruiting new audiences. The point there is that transparency or just making the information available, that only works when we have a healthy normative information environment in place to guide new information in sensible and valid ways. And in many cases, that is the opposite of the way platforms work or data-driven systems work today and the tendency, or, or even machine learning and the explainability problem and the tendency there to make data processes more opaque and more disconnected from human understanding. So, I mean, there's a moment here in the earlier writings, some of the earlier writings, there's a moment in the writings of anthropologist Mary Douglas when she raises this as a kind of a tongue in cheek question. The way she puts it is essentially to say, don't people understand that the more complicated in-depth information we provide to everyone, 
the more opportunities for misunderstanding and speculation. And we just have to look at climate change. Now, the point isn't, let's go back to when only the priests read the Bible that comes with its own problems. But it is to say that certainty, in, in Douglas's own words, is only possible because doubt gets blocked institutionally. So for me, the question here is, what kinds of speculation get devalued as, you know, hum oh, it's just human subjectivity, oh, it's biased, let's replace that with data. So what kinds of truth making gets devalued? And what other kinds of speculations actually get amplified and legitimized, perhaps presented as something that is objective or data driven? Mm -hmm. So different kinds of speculations get treated in different ways. And in the book, I try to get into this a little bit by digging into what kind of concrete data gets collected and used, how all of these uncertainties get repackaged into predictions or insights in the war on terror. What I'm going to show you here is the video of a man named Sami Osmakaj, a Muslim Albanian American. Osmakaj was a man who had previously been known to intelligence agencies as someone who makes some extremist comment. He's very anti-American imperialism but not much more. There was talk, but no hint of action. However, at some point he becomes identified and classified as a suspect by the FBI. And that's when you see a kind of change in the data that he is compelled to produce. In this video on the left, you see uh, with the mosaic face, an FBI undercover agent who brings Osma Koch to this hotel and supplies him with the weapons and equipment that you see. Um, so this undercover agent with the pseudonym Amir Jones, he's coaching Osmakach on how to use these weapons because the guy has no clue how to use them otherwise. He doesn't have any experience. The FBI also gave him money to buy these weapons because he can't afford them on his own. Later, they would continue to encourage him. They would ask him, uh, they would sort of uh, encourage him to act on his intentions or his feelings. Um, they would even pay for his taxi so that he could drive himself to the attack spot where he was meant to execute some kind of plan, where, of course, the FBI is waiting to arrest him. When they did, internally, the FBI called this the Hollywood ending, because what they managed to do is create the kind of data that is necessary to justify this arrest from a legal and operational point of view. And of course, the upshot of all of this is that nobody's ever going to know if the arrest was completely just or completely unjust because it was a preemptive arrest. So we'll never know what exactly he might have done if he has stayed free. What we see here is a speculative logic that takes uncertainties around human intention and behavior and formalizes them into the kind of data that's going to count, that's going to be legible for the institutionalized regime at hand. And this is something that is often plugged into a lot more cutting edge data collection systems and the kind of electronic dragnets that Snowden talked about. But the example that I give you is also a very old school and human process. Because a lot of the, in a lot of these cases, what we have is not a technology first problem. Often what we talk about when we talk about algorithmic bias or the failure of automated systems it's often happening as a combination of all these existing procedures and institutional processes and pre existing prejudices in and around the code. One of these external factors in Osma Kaj's case was of course the political demand for certainty. This overbearing imperative in post 9-11 politics that the next terrorist attack had to be stopped no matter the human cost. Right? And this is a legacy where the idea of the lone wolf terrorist sort of becomes the most popular bogeyman in Washington for about a decade. The idea that terrorism has become so unpredictable that we really do need more invasive forms of electronic surveillance in order to defeat this uncertainty. So terrorism becomes characterized as a data problem. It is argued that we've got no choice but to develop this kind of indiscriminate surveillance systems. The problem is that when we zoom into the kind of data that is actually handled by these systems, we start to see that there's a yawning gap between the promise of prediction and the messiness of data. Consider, for example, the survey, which was used by FBI agents in the mid 2010s as part of their assessment of terrorism subjects. So, it, you know, it's, it's the agent sitting down. And again, this is pretty old fashioned in terms of tech, um, trying to see how much of a risk this person is. 
but the basic principles behind which behavioral indicators are uh, cobbled together in order to generate um, predictive insights or predictive judgment um, places something like this on a continuum with more algorithmically driven systems like such as Compass or Predpol. What is striking here though is the reliance on what they called weak indicators. So this is where terrorism is the kind of statistically rare and singular event where strong behavioral proxies from a statistical point of view are very difficult to obtain. It's not like this happens every week and you can derive uh, um, frequentist uh, analyses over time. So this problem is overcome not by scaling back the ambition of prediction, but rather saying we're gonna to turn to weaker proxies and formalize a pathway for that weaker data to nevertheless provide actionable judgment. So if we look at the kinds of questions they're asking, has the subject experienced a divorce lately? Have they been victims of assault? Have they played laser tag? So it's really scraping the barrel in terms of behavioral data. It is never really the case that the data is out there and compels us to do all of this. And this is also where a lot of existing prejudices and disparities and power relations creep back into the data, right? This, the survey, this survey asks about cases like being in contact with overseas extremists, religious conversion, or changing physical appearance. And we may note that all of these things would apply to a jihadist, but none of these things would really apply to a domestic white supremacist. So even though the idea of the lone wolf and all of these surveillance systems post 9-11 are wrapped around the justificatory logic of data-driven objective prediction, in practice, this unknown tends to be implicitly filled in with the figure of the imagined brown killer, or as Jasper Poir and Amit Rai explained, tied to the, long, uh, the older figure of the monster. So, this remains quite implicit, at least in this kind of uh, formal survey, but it can seep out more explicitly in informal ways. This is a training slide deck from the NSA, where they literally, you know, this is a fake name they use for training purposes, and they literally say it, right? They say, you know, uh, the terrorist in our training example is Mohammed bad guy. So it's this kind of the laziest kind of uh, uh, stereotypical fake name they can come up with. So there is this percolating imaginary uh, or a set of speculative ideas about terrorism that is interweaved into data-driven systems at every level. The trouble is that statistically, the majority of violent mass killings in the United States since 9-11 have come at the hands of white supremacists, a threat that these intelligence agencies are now publicly admitting that they didn't invest enough resources in. They didn't develop enough models and surveillance systems for them. They didn't orient their data collection towards that threat enough. And the irony is that even the name of the lone wolf actually originates with white supremacists in the 1990s. People like Tom Metzger, who is actually literally an ex Ku Klux Klan grand wizard. And for them, the lone wolf is imagined as this kind of heroic masculine struggle for white supremacy. And yet the term has since become a way to fixate these surveillance systems on the figure of the brown bearded terrorist. So in the book, I describe these moments as places where the, there is a fantasy of epistemic purity. It's this fantasy that raw data untainted by human subjectivity is surely going to rationalize our decision making. And the problem here is that this fantasy of purity through data often intersect with older fantasies of racial purity or of purifying te territories or of purifying the nation. And the point here is that data is always composed of choices, right? We're making choices or choices are being made for us about what we try to predict, what we measure as a proxy for what, what we trust as a reliable measurement. And so in talking about technology as a speculation, I'm, I'm pointing towards some of the ways in which these choices tend to get buried in the language of prediction and objectivity. But of course, these kinds of, these speculative forms of truth making in and around the data, they are not simply side effects. I would argue that in many ways, they are the primary effect. They are the reward of what we call big data or artificial intelligence. Because what these systems buy you is the power to act, right? To the power to be able to say something is known, it is predictable, our judgment is objective. It is such a powerful thing to be able to say, 
oh yes, the data may have might have some bias or something, but the decision is really more objective, and 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 we can't really tell you what happened with the algorithms either. It's a very powerful position to be in. So the question isn't whether data-driven technologies are pulling us towards some point of objective truth about the empirical world. The question is who is in a position to be able to afford this new power to measure and predict in new ways? And who is on the short end of the stick? Who is the one stepping into the scanners and filling out the forms and turning their own bodies into data um, in, in, for the sake of these uh, decision-making systems? And so what the book tries to do is make connections across different contexts where these dynamics are playing out. Because I think if we just look at a single context, um, one of the risks is that we miss what happens when similar principles or arguments get leveraged elsewhere. So we might sit here and say, I find certain kinds of data-driven fact-making acceptable as part of this abstract war on terror um, waged against this imagined figure of the lone wolf. However, those same people might turn around to find similar logics staring at them in their job interview, right? And so that's why in the book I turned to what I mentioned before, um, which is the popularization of self-tracking technologies from wearables like Fitbit to smart home devices like the Amazon Ring over the past decade, right? And this has become a really burgeoning business. This has become a big business over the last 10 years, partly through the work of this international community uh, called the Quantify Self, which of course originates with, um, with Silicon Valley tech enthusiasts. And this burgeoning business has now seen everything from claims to track stress, to sleep, to mood, to friendships, even sexual performance at this individualized level. Um, the idea being that these machines will generate objective data about our every, everyday life in such a fine grained way that they will, and this is a phrase that I heard a lot in my research, um, that they will know us better than we know ourselves. That's sort of the idea, right? And so on the face of it, this seems quite different from questions of state surveillance and far less problematic maybe. Um, or that's what a lot of people told me um, five or six years ago when I was talking to folks about this. And that's part of the promotional rhetoric, right? The idea behind the quantify self or the self-tracking technologies was this pitch that we can own our data. Let's empower ourselves. Let's fulfill that old Socratic mission to know thyself, right? So that's sort of the ways in which these data-driven systems were being suggested and promoted. But in fact, there are similarities where these are also imperfect and always imperfect technologies that are serving as conduits for new forms of speculative fact-making. And what I mean by that is it's really changing the rules of the game, as Pierre Bourdieu would put it, around who gets to declare the truth of how healthy or how productive I am. And then this dynamic has wider repercussions because the data, as we are learning, never stays still, right? Everything about the way that Valley entrepreneurship and VC funding works, for example, uh, this kind of pursuit for the unicorn company or this idea of pivoting to different business models um, on, on, uh, um, um, at, at a moment's notice, um, or the technical design of large data sets and predictive analytics and their predilection towards recombining existing data for new, uh, new forms of analyses. All of these things incentivize these companies to reuse and recycle data. So the data always travels and it creates new rules around what counts as truth. We can look at this with the example of something like Fitbit, which really is the poster child for, for some of these uh, self-tracking technologies at this point, right? And so the marketing and popular discourse around the Fitbit really goes back to that original idea. It's this very familiar formula. You're a rational individual. You're the good liberal subject. You're empowered with this objective data and fancy technology to know ourselves better. And this is tied to this, again, familiar aesthetic of aspirational middle-class professionalism and affluence. And there's just a straight line we can draw historically from at least uh, wellness imagery in the 1970s at least, right? So there's a, it's a very familiar cultural history of this uh, intersection of, again, affluence, professionalism, self-improvement, and these kinds of technologies and practices. So far, so familiar. 
But over the five, last five to seven years, what we've also seen Pro Fitbit do is they've been proactively partnering with, for example, insurance companies such as John Hancock. They are pivoting to what they call an interactive package. And this is where data from your Fitbit, or in this case, your subsidized Apple Watch, or even your partnering gym, these, the data is passed on to your insurance company for future recombination and use. Now, the direct use of such data to recalculate individual premiums is not quite permitted in the US at this point. But that kind of relationship is obviously the horizon of potential use. And that's what we need to focus on, right? Because if you give people the keys to the cookie jar and then they pinky promise that they're only going to use it, I don't know, to, to clean the jar, you can't, you can't be surprised later, right? You can't say, oh, we shouldn't be talking about things that haven't happened yet. There is a reasonable set of recurring patterns around the travel and use of this data that uh, forces us to think about some of those implications one or two degrees out. And what we see in these growing instances is how there are new avenues for data collection. They get negotiated through an idealized future where we know ourselves in an objective way and we ostensibly exercise control over the data. So that's the promise of certainty that we start with. But then that scenario gets pushed out into, again, this idyllic future. And in the meantime of the present of these uncertain, imperfect technologies, we are vulnerable to what I call control creep, where these forms of datafication get crafted for one purpose, and then they inevitably expand into other social domains. And this is where the truth of who I am or what is good for me becomes, starts to become determined by those other than myself. Not even starts though, because of course, it's not that we had full control of our truth before at any point. It's more about a continuation of existing struggles and pre-existing asymmetries in which we have always had to be subject to certain ways in which other institutions, other forms of documentation, other forms of measurement will determine our truths. And it's a rebalancing of these kinds of, uh, um, these kinds of bargains or these kinds of relations, not always in our favor. So where do we stand after all this? In the book, um, I conclude by calling out the technological default, the tendency to say, that every social problem can surely be measured and predicted and solved with technology. But also the tendency, which I think is more dangerous, the tendency to turn to technology's own concepts and values in order to assess its impact on society, right? Too often technology sort of gets judged by its own standards. We are at a moment in time when critical conversations about technology have become far more visible and widespread than even, even 2013 when the Snowden affair began and when I started working on this. Um, but there are now choices we need to make about what kind of critique is going to make what kind of difference. So here I know I'm picking a very easy target, but this is something that we all know, the social dilemma. Um, and without going into it further, I think the most striking thing about it for me was how this it, the social dilemma is very critical of platforms like Facebook but they are critical in a way that fundamentally reproduces technology's greatest fantasy, the fantasy that it really works like it promises to work, that you can really reduce people into these data points, you can do it accurately, and that it really does brainwash people in this instrumental way, which, which is a fantasy that I would argue that in the long term is going to bolster Facebook's, um, Facebook's influence and Facebook's ability to shrug off, uh, shrug off these kinds of criticisms. Because for me, the problem isn't that Facebook is so incredibly good at what they do. The problem is that Facebook is staggeringly incompetent at their job, despite their immense riches. We saw that with something like, like we saw that with Kenosha. When Facebook receives over 400 individual user reports, their own users telling them, guys, here's a Facebook group calling yourself the Kenosha Guard. They are advocating violence and murder openly. And Facebook rejects those reports and does nothing. And then a shooter goes out to Kenosha on the 25th of August, 2020 and kills two people with an assault rifle. So it's those places of basic failure that I would argue tells us more about Facebook than this kind of visualization. And for me, it's an important step to reject technology's own narratives about how 
automation is inevitable or the technology is more efficient or that the most dominant platform must surely be the most competent one. And at the most, at, at, at the broadest level, it comes down to a variation of Audre Law's famous point on the master's tools. It is this idea that the values that produced modern technology in the first place, the values and the paradigms and the standards that we use to talk about how they are efficient or progressive, those values are never going to betray technology in a debate about how we should live, in a debate about whether we should abolish these tools. What we need in, is a more historically and conceptually situated critique of what it means to claim that the data is objective or that criminality or productivity can be predicted. And I think we are starting to get that over the last few years um, from a wide variety of amazing scholars um, and in ways that often draw productively on scholarship that came before that as well. Um, and we have people like Mar Hicks who are correcting our historical imagination of how computing technology came about. We have people like Tim Gebru's pioneering work in AI ethics that has made a lasting impact despite Google's retaliatory firing. In this very room um, about to speak, we have Luke Stark whose work on how these technologies are reshaping what counts as emotion when they quantify it. So along with these kinds of scholars, what this book tries to chip in with is trying to help lay some of the groundwork for kind of, the kind of critique that doesn't just ask these systems to correct the most egregious errors in their database, the kind of critique that doesn't just tell them to improve their facial recognition systems to detect black faces better, but also tries to open up future conversations about what it might look like to walk away from such a technology. What do we need to have the institutional and regulatory and power structures in place to be able to do that? Um, what does it mean to build around the quality of our information ecosystems as opposed to quantity? So Jennifer, thank you for the question. Um, in I'm actually just about to wrap up here. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll come back to your question as well in when we get to the Q&A. Um, so let me stop here for now. And, and in the response from Luke to follow and, and Q&A, I, I do very much welcome your questions and comment and criticism. So thank you so much. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sinha, for that very cogent speech and talk about your about your book. So let's hand it over to Luke, uh, who is um, going to give us this response. Uh, thank you so much, Alina. Uh, thank you so much, Sinha. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see both of you in this virtual space. Um, and I'm uh, flattered, though, though uh, humbled and unworthy to be mentioned in the same uh, breath as Mar Hicks and Timmy Jeffrey, I'll put it that way. Um, uh, I'm just going to share my slides, if I can find my slides. I have slides. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, just a second. OK. So um, th this was a, a pleasure to read and and a pleasure to hear um, your account, Sangha, and even more of a pleasure because I um, actually sorry, I'm just going to do this differently. Um, so I was reading through this this book and I hit about page it's page seventy eight I think um, uh, a, a line that kind of just uh, threw me a little bit uh, in a good way because it connected explicitly this project which I'd already sort of been 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 intuiting as I read through the first couple of chapters with um, a paper that I've been working on now for a couple of years um, on um, on the conjectural sciences and their relationship to artificial intelligence. And um, so I'm going to I'm going to respond um, to this talk and to the book um, in in this way if the, and and I think hopefully this is this is in some ways a kind of extension and or a kind of um, a deepening of some of the arguments in the book, um, because you're making <laughs> some of the arguments um, that I, I have also been thinking about making, and, and, and I'm thrilled. Um, I'm thrilled there's such overlap. Um, oops. So the the title of of the of the um, of my talk is, um, as I say, artificial intelligence and the conjectural sciences, or a serendipitous response to um, technologies of speculation. And I'm just going to. Go into the slideshow now. 
move this around. And um, I'm hoping in Q and A, somehow we can we can talk more about the kind of context for 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 all of this. So um, so there there's been a, a number of claims made um, recently by various. Um, eminent institutions about how AI and the so-called AI revolution is changing the practice of science, of scientific research, but also how, not just scientific research, but also scientific um, practice, right? And there are um, a number, have been a number of claims that, um, that these kind of uh, large, you know, large data sets and um, convolutional deep neural networks, you know, some of these, some of these kind of machine learning techniques are, um, you know, they offer the prospect of extrapolating results from data without underlying models in theory. This is the claim of the people, you know, pushing these systems. You know, in, in other words, you know, in, instead of kind of coming up with an hypothesis and, 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 um, and then collecting data to test the hypothesis, that you just collect the data itself and, and it produces, you know, it finds you, um, it finds you your, 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 your um, evidence and your, your outputs. Um, sort of de novo. And what what this um, what this connects to in uh, what connected to in the book um, as I was reading along was this this citation um, um, uh, that that somehow you've made um, uh, talking about you know this 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 specific me method of fabrication, you know the creation of of mechanisms for for sort of creating truth. In which trivial traces left behind by the body and its most mundane activities are rev revalorized as the secret clues to one's health, happiness, and productivity. And it extends and modifies the tradition of what Carlo Ginsburg calls conjectural knowledge, an interpretive method based on taking marginal and irrelevant details as revealing clues. And um, and this is what this is what stopped me because I I had been working with and thinking about this concept of conjectural knowledge and conjectural science um, in the context of AI myself. And and so. Um, I think what what this this serendipitous kind of kind of convergence on this idea of conjectural knowledge suggests, right, is actually, um, you know, I think implicit in the argument of your book, which is that in many cases, you know, AI and and and, and machine learning techniques don't actually produce what we would colloquially today consider science at all, right? Or, or maybe we might consider it science because as as STS or media studies scholars, but it's not what people would think of when they consider science. And actually, I think even 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 more perhaps provocatively, you know, the, the activities of ML-based science and ML-based prediction, uh, so to, so called, demonstrate that in many cases performing such science is actually impossible and how always has been impossible. And and in this way, in this case, and as in many other cases, Artificial intelligence is, is kind of throwing a spotlight on um, longstanding historical problems and challenges in the practice and, and underpinning empirical underpinnings of science, epistemological underpinnings of science, along with many other things. Um, and and it's, it's taken the hype around this new technology to um, to you know to redirect or direct our attention to these problems. So I want to elaborate here on on. Uh, Sangha's observation um, that machine learning uh, driven prediction, you know, involves um, it involves speculation to sort of say that actually that that, that fundamentally a large amount of ML driven science um, involving certain categories of data, especially data about humans, is fundamentally conjectural. So you you won't be surprised for me to say that. And we we'll can come back. I think we'll come back at the end of the talk to the the question of if there's much difference between conjecture and speculation. Um, these conjectural sciences produce conclusions reliant on post facto interpretation, right? Partial inductive insights misinterpreted as widely applicable deductive truths. And so, and so my, my claim here is that in many of the areas machine learning is purported to have its widest application, particularly in, um, as Sangha has noted, right, in classifying human bodies, human fitness, human mood, uh, human behavior, and human social worlds. Um, this, this, we're not talking about what we would consider science really at all. 
So, um, what is what spawned this 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 you know, what what piece produced this um this kind of conjunction in in our thinking? Well, it's it's a piece called Morelli, Freud, and Sherlock Holmes: Clues in Scientific Method by the Italian historian Carlo Ginzburg. And Carlo Ginzburg, um, uh, I first came across it, as a graduate student, a master's student in history. My background is a, as a historian when we read his famous piece, uh, his famous book, The Cheese and the Worms, which is a, a, a great book, by the way, and very readable if anyone wants to, wants to pick up um, a historical text, uh, which is um, the tale of a, a 16th century Italian miller who um, taught himself to read. He had read a, a smattering of different, different texts, you know, religious, secular, and started um, kind of proselytizing, preaching a very uh, heterogeneous and unique kind of form of, of religious belief, where the most colorful example being that he, you know, that had a model of the universe as a giant cheese, and the angels in the giant cheese is the worms. Um, or, uh, so uh, this obviously drew at the attention of the ecclesiastical authorities, and uh, he was first reprimanded and told to stop preaching because he was seen to be harmless, but he continued to to to, to do so, and he was eventually he was eventually uh, executed by the church. And and Ginsburg in this book. Um, uh, initiated, though not not always, um, though he doesn't always associate himself with with with, with this genre, uh, a genre called microhistory, where um, you know looking at a particular rich, um, detailed uh, vignette from a particular time helps, um, uh, as it were, put a microscope um, on um, on a phenomena that then that then gives some some insights into the broader kind of kind of social and cultural worlds in which that vignette takes place and uh, for those interested uh, Ginsburg had another book um, this was actually written before that she's in the worms they were translated after about uh, 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 witchcraft and agrarian cults uh, in the 16th century and has and has a really interesting whole kind of trailing interest in kind of kind of vernacular and popular um, responses to witchcraft and so these themes, this interest in different kinds of knowledge and so-called high and low forms of knowledge, quote unquote, right, expert knowledge versus vernacular knowledge, or maybe different kinds of expert knowledge, um, comes out in this piece, Freud and Raleigh Holmes, because what, what he's looking at is the kind of, the kind of similarities between the, the technique of 19th century art critic Giovanni Morelli, um, the, uh, the famous psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, and um, Sherlock Holmes, you know, the, the, the fictional detective created by Conan Doyle. And in all three of these cases, uh, what, um, what Ginsburg points to, right, is this idea of, of a kind of the kind of, a kind of interpretive meth method. Is, these are examples of interpretive method based on taking marginal and irrelevant details as revealing clues, right? Details considered trivial and unimportant, you know, beneath notice. Um, in Ginsburg works, you know, for Freud, furnish the key to the highest achievement of human genius. So for Morelli, it was, you know, identifying the particular rapid strokes of kind of dashed off hands and ears and, and um, other parts of Renaissance painters that showed who had actually done the painting. And, um, you know, so, so, for, so Holmes, of course, being, being um, a kind of, uh, interestingly, a fictional, uh, a fictional uh, vision of this kind of this kind of method, um, but Ginsburg traces this idea, this kind of idea of of the of the kind of the clue and the conjectural the conjectural narrative based on the clue, back through a very long, very genealogy. Um, he takes it back to Babylonian divination. He talks about hunters in the snow looking at tracks of animals and and you know creating a narrative out of the tracks of of, of an animal, and um, you know, and 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 of course, uh, the 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 point here is that this kind of conjectural knowledge, this conjectural science, um, is all about um, ex post facto creation of narratives. It's all about um, you know you know not having a kind of regular and repeatable set of data for whatever reason to be able to to extrapolate from, and so needing to extrapolate um, you know uh, uh, causes from effects. Um, uh, and and that that you know running across a wide range of disciplines, including uh, painters, um, you know uh, uh, many other uh, uh, practitioners of what you would call the human sciences, and uh, perhaps most most intriguingly, doctors, medicine, and actually of course Ginsburg points out that uh, medicine unites Morelli, Freud, and Holmes in in, in various ways. 
Um, so uh, Ginsburg contrasts this kind of this kind of paradigm, this kind of epistemological paradigm of conjecture, with um, you know what he calls the kind of scientific empiricism um, of someone like Galileo. Right, where um, you would use mathematics and the experimental method, you know, you're, you're measuring and repeating phenomena, right? You're, you're looking for aggregations um, and regular and repeatable uh, phenomena to to account for. And you know, and as he points out, it's actually very, it's quite difficult for even a discipline like medicine to um, be regular and repeatable in the way that um, physics, Galilean physics, would be. If actually, actually, it's even hard for for um, for many of what the so-called natural or hard sciences to totally live up to this, this ideal. But, um, but certainly in terms of, of sciences like um, uh, philology, um, you know, uh, uh, medicine, other kind of, kind of sciences dealing with the human, right? Um, it's, 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 it's well nigh impossible for, um, for, you know, conjectural science to be transformed into an empirical science. So, um, the you know Ginsburg begins his um, his piece by by kind of kind of pointing to even in the 1970s the the kind of debates methodological debates between quantitative and qualitative research and 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 sort of you know wants to make the point that those distinctions aren't aren't quite right and 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 you know and has this historical lineage to think about it. Um, but here, in, in so in the paper that I've I've been working on, um, and which will now be be greatly bolstered by somehow by your book, um, I I advance a different critique, which which echoes yours, which is that that AI techniques, when applied to data about humans and the social world, are conjectural science raised to its most acute, uh, but possibly also its most dangerous form. And I'll just point to um, the you know this this. Um, this quote from from technologies of speculation, right? This this idea that oh, and sorry, just to say, right? This and so this idea of of um, of of conjectural of um, uh, the, the need to the ability to, to just take the data as it is and get get rid of any need for models and hypotheses, um, you know, which which would seemingly kind of support the Galilean empirical position, um, isn't just common in the sciences. It's also common um, in kind of broader discussions about the, um, you know, about big data and about the, the impacts of big data and AI on life. So this, you know, best maybe, you know, most stereotypically um, put forward by the writer Chris Anderson about 10 years ago in this, this piece in Wired called The End of Theory, right? The idea that scientific method has made, been made obsolete by just having all these piles of data that you can just, you know, you can just, um, well, you can just kind of look, the patterns will speak for themselves, right? And in similar ways, um, the the sort of sort of the desire for a kind of more computational social science, right? But but you know what 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 seems to have been have been lost by many of the proponents of 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 these kind of kind of computationally driven social sciences, right? Is that um, these are still you know attempts to use the power of or the power the the, the power and prestige of large amounts of data to um, turn, you know, to turn conjectural sciences into empirical ones, right? To claim regularity and predictability and certainty to use, to use, you know, a term from technologies of speculation when, when in fact, conceptually we know none exists. And, um, you know, Ginsburg observes that it's, you know, he, he, he notes that um, um, a wide array of conjectural sciences existed in the 19, um, 19th century and have, or have developed since, some of which we, we would now dismiss as uh, pseudoscientific, right? So he points, makes the point that um, phrenology and physiognomy, right, the study, the kind of claim or the study of, of uh, you know, determining inner states and inner character from exterior uh, appearance are absolutely um, conjectural, right? There are practices of extrapolating about human character um, involving an analysis of particular cases constructed only through traces, symptoms, and hints um, visible on the exterior of the body. But when that kind of that kind of individual case work um, attempts, you know, is, is attempted to be aggregated, as in this example from um, the work of eugenicist Sir Francis Galton in trying to determine um, criminality via stacking photographs of criminals and, and, and trying to, de to determine the common sort of facial features of those people. Um, the, the, uh, the power, you know, the, 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 any power uh, that conjecture has in kind of individual cases uh, begins to break down. 
Um, and uh, this is a, you know another another kind of example of, of the ways in which um, uh, this, in this case, a visual narrative, you know, helps support kind of kind of dubious phrenological and physiognomic conjectures. Right. This is a kind of simply a kind of a, an image um, claiming, making the claim that um, people who look like bulls have the characteristics of bulls. Um, much of which is built on the fact that the artist has has you know has sketched these two uh, things as looking this looking similar, right? Um, without any kind of you know particular um, particular empirical uh, grounding. And right, and so and so this gets to the problem with um, with conjectural science, um, which is that it is, as Ginsburg um, later points out, um, you know, it's 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 uh, always anthropocentric, ethnocentric, and liable to other biases, other specific biases. So um, when um, in technology speculation, um, Sangha makes the point. Right, that um, decisions of political and moral import are embedded in the kind of methodological habits of, of, of determining what clues count and which evidence counts. Um, to me, right, that, that, that's, that's, that's another way of saying um, who decides the narrative and on what, what grounds um, and, and how that narrative is then transformed into, into a kind of empirical, empirical gold standard for objectivity, right, is, is um, often very much occluded by um, by the what I would call the kind of charisma of numbers uh, that that you know get brought into brought to bear in big data and AI analysis, and a, a really good example of of this kind of this kind of everyday this kind of contemporary you know masquerading of conjecture as as kind of empirical evidence is the famous um, so called gay face study published by Wang Kaczynski in twenty eighteen, right, which um, claims to be able to um, identify the facial feature, uh, the, the sexual orientation of, of people via, via their facial features and photographs. And, and, and there's lots to say about this, which we can talk about in the Q&A, but I want to just draw attention to um, a, a chunk of text from the author's um, uh, justification for the study. And what they say is, right, they say that, that they justify, you know, the, their, their, their project by saying that the existence of links between facial appearance and character is supported by the fact Right, that people can accurately judge others' character, psychological states, and demographic traits from their faces. Um, wh wh what do they say about that kind of judgment? Such judgments are not very accurate, but are common and spontaneous. Right. So, so the justification here is that is a, is a conjectural one, uh, one that says, oh well, some you know sometimes we have a kind of gut feeling about how people are, and by, with enough data, we can extrapolate that gut feeling. Which of course um, is not not in fact the case, and um, you know this common and spontaneous and often inaccurate judgments that we make as individuals cannot epistemologically be aggregated into general and repeatable empirical rules, and yet that is exactly what Wang and Kaczynski claim that they can do in in the gay face research and in more recent research where they claim they can they can you can tell political party by your face, which is you know seems seems outrageous. Um, but it seems outrageous. But but as as Sun Kang Hong points out, right? This is this is the kind of kind of the way in which um, you know truth is is manufactured and different kinds of truth count, right? And um, per, this, so this the way in which conjectural science has been has been um, uh, datafied and 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 glossed with a kind of veneer of objectivity is precisely an example. Of you know the extension, distortion, and modification of this long-standing tendency, um, uh, and long-standing tension um, that that goes back, according to Ginsburg's formulation, for several hundred years. Um, there's a lot to say about about um, these questions of conjectural versus empirical epistemology in, in health and medicine. Um, I'm teaching a class this semester on artificial intelligence in human health, and what, one of the ways I'm I'm asking students to think about these these questions is, is precisely what you know where the balance is in different studies and in different applications of AI technology. Um, you know what what counts as um, empirical evidence in healthcare versus conjectural evidence and, and when is empirical evidence um, versus conjectural evidence more valuable right of course we know that you know conjecture is not not a panacea for anything um, right um, we know that we know that, that that many white doctors um, you know ignore the pain of black patients we know that male doctors often uh, minimize the concerns of, 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 of uh, female patients um, and uh, so right so so you know conjecture the kind of the gut feeling, that that um, underpins the conjectural knowledge, um, you know, can be really destructive. 
but we I think we we have the the worst of both worlds when those conjectural um, uh, you know, conjectural speculations, let's say, right, are are at the base of um, you know big data powered um, attempts to to aggregate data and and then make predictions about individuals back right based on that aggregation. Um, much like as as um, Sang Sang ha points out in the book, right, in apps like Clover Health, right, which which um, you know is is simultaneously doing this kind of big data kind of uh, agglomeration, but is you know also um, you know making particular claims around around medical practice. Um, you, you know the, the 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 general consensus in in AI and healthcare suggests, and this would not be surprising to someone like Ginsburg that the spaces where artificial intelligence works best in healthcare are on narrowly definable and well well articulated problems right so for instance um, um, uh, diagnosing um, you know the shape of a damage in the optic nerve due to diabetes right as opposed to you know more complicated and, or more diffuse um, clinical clinical uses um, of course again i'm i'm, I'm not saying that, that the diagnosis of pain in the optic nerve doesn't have you know its own sets of uh, contingent and socially constructed challenges and problems, right? We, we as good STS scholars, we know that. But um, you know, I think it's, I think it's, you know, if 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 we know that those challenges already exist in these narrowly defined problems, we can really say that um, that that conjectural science, um, you know, you know, ha has no place in um, the kind of kind of broader big data analysis of 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 more kind of social phenomena. Social phenomena like emotion, and so I'll, you know, as a nod to my own work, I'm, I'm currently writing a book on on the the quantification and, and uh, conceptualization of emotion by computer science, and emotion is a is a classic case of a of a phenomenon um, that uh, the computer science has sought to produce certainty in by um, you know by avoiding thinking about a, a large amount of the experience. Um, you know, I think I think this is you know this is to me um, uh, you know the the kind of the kind of underlying idea that I've seen in a lot of my work on on how computer scientists understand and treat emotion, right? Which which is which is you know this this the sense that um, that that certainty has to be created hell or hell or high water, right? And that and that um, the conjectural sciences um, can be roped into that creation of certainty. Um, even if, even if the, the the kind of the kind of you know, even if it, the, the the kind of big datafied forms of certainty that that um, data analysis in those spaces produces um, doesn't actually you know doesn't actually say much about the actual the real world. Um, this is a slide from uh, GCHQ's Squeaky Dolphin presentation leaked by Edward Snowden, right? Um, Kate Crawford often cites this piece or this slide, um, and you know this this desire to 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 rope in. Um, the human sciences into the into the kind of the kind of big datafied creation of certainty to rope in even magic as well as personality anthropology and sociology. Um, I think um, you know just is an illustration of 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 Sangha, your 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 point um, about the the kind of the kind of messiness and indeterminacy of um, of these of you know of, of these purportedly certain um, artifacts. And, and I think to, to, to conclude, right, um, I think it's important to note that outside the pages of the detective novel, right, the kind of the kind of almost infallible Sherlock Holmesian conjecture is absolute nonsense, right? It's 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 a it's a fiction, it's a fantasy. Um, you know, so the the this desire to um, simultaneously um, you know, reify and raise up the possibility of kind of perfect conjecture as a, as a substitute for for a prediction. Um, I think suggests uh, you know a, a real a real um, a set of set of of, of uh, problems with the kind of the kind of um, you know the, the kind of educational and psychological uh, you know kind of norms um, in Silicon Valley more broadly. Um, so, I mean, you know, I will say, of course, scientists cannot and should not operate without conjecture. To do so would be impossible, right? Um, but, you know, the point here is that even if elements of, of even if even, uh, you know, places like medicine and, um, and other sort of 
sort of um, uh, paradigms of the sort, um, all, you know, are so are so shot through with conjecture, then um, you know we need to be extremely careful with um, valorizing those conjectures through big data and big data systems. We might in the Q and A think about the kind of overlaps and differences between speculation and conjecture, um, you know, and the kind of the kind of emphasis on on sight and and thought in speculation, and the emphasis on, um, uh, you know, on guessing, on 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 predicting in, in conjecture. Um, but I think, um, uh, and again, this is work that's ongoing. I think that um, hopefully this making this distinction between empirical and, and conjectural um, science in the context of AI, um, you know, will help us to, um, as Sangha suggests, um, uh, know when we should resist the temptation to datafy and predict, to produce knowledge out of human bodies and lives, right? Because if we know that some phenomena are, are indeed, um, you know, grounded in, in this kind of ex post facto conjecture and in narratives that, that we, we construct after the fact, um, we also know that it's, it's, you know, we can know that it's extraordinarily dangerous to, um, to, to gloss those, those narratives and those conjectures with the, the, kind of, the kind of charisma of big data and big data systems. So that's my response. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, it was truly serendipitous and exciting to kind of kind of realize that there was this this intersection between our work, and I am looking forward to questions and answers. Great, great. Thank you so much, Luke, for for that you know the response. It was uh, yes, really great to to hear how both your work just you know speaks to each other in these ways, and love the uh, the comparison to. Sherlock Holmes. So uh, let's uh, you know, let's have Sunha, you know, um, formulate his response and also perhaps a response to Jennifer's question in the chat. And if the rest of the um, the attendees don't mind, if you could type in your questions into the chat, I will channel them to the speakers. Thank you. Yeah. So um, please, please um, feel free to throw questions at us in the chat for for myself and Luke. But I can start by um, responding a bit to Luke, and I think I can also include um, Jennifer's point there about brainwashing. Um, question there about brainwashing. So first of all, thank you, Luke. Um, I think this is that was so, so generous, and and I think it's another example of how the book really doesn't depend on the writer; it depends on the reader in many ways. If the reader is smart, then then the book becomes better. So so. It's very gratifying to hear how, um, the intersections and in your reading and your own work come into all of this. I actually want to go backwards and just point out a couple of things. And I, I want to start by, you talked about facial recognition and you talked, you threaded Ginsburg through this contemporary critique of AI and facial recognition as this kind of shameless revival of old physiognomic conjecture. Um, and what I want to add to that is, first of all, that doesn't surprise us when we look at the kind of prediction data that goes into these terror studies in the 2000s, right? This kind of what I said was scraping the barrel in terms yeah. of behavioral data, where the logic is not, we can predict, therefore we should, but no, we must predict, so we'll make it work. But I would also go further and say, we've been doing physiognomy in our society all this time, the last hundred years, when it comes to crime, the cops have been doing it. And more widely, cop culture, the culture of the mugshot, which hotly has its origins in the kinds of work that uh, Galton was doing. And so, so I had Dr. Aaron Shapiro in one of my classes this week, and he's done work on things like Hunch Lab, these predictive policing models. And in his ethnography, and Sarah Brain does this as well, they come across these instances where the algorithms want to predict criminality. And then the cops are there saying, I don't trust you guys. I'm leery of how you're taking away my authority. I know yeah. what a bad guy looks like when I see one. I know what where the bad guys are. I know how to look for them. And they can be right or wrong at a purely individualized level. But what they are practicing more broadly is this, this conjectural knowledge. And they're trying to defend the conjectural knowledge, not from empirical sciences, I would argue, but they're defending their right to do yeah. conjecture on other people's lives yeah. and saying, don't come into my turf. It's my conjecture, not yours. And I see that as sort of the recurring conflict that goes on where you spoke about 
the similarities and possible differences in speculation and conjecture. And I think it's a matter of emphasis where the part that I would put a lot of emphasis on, and I think you do as well, is it's not code versus human, right? It's not conjecture versus empirical, right? It's which set of people and institutions want to keep or take the power to declare this kind of conjectural truth away from other people. Is it the cops that do it or is it the algorithm that does it or is it someone else that does it? And so there's this kind of, and I, I think there's, that's why there's a heavy level of moralization and a lot of imaginary work that goes on to talk up these technologies as perfect or brainwashing. Um, and, and Jennifer raised that initial question about brainwashing technology and what that reminds me of, or what these social dilemma style conversations remind me of is that there's a long history of the Cold War imaginary. So e.g. we've got these instances in which the CIA says the Chinese have developed brainwashing technology. So we've got to do it as well. And it turns out the Chinese didn't develop such a technology and it's the CIA and that goes much further in these kinds of now lampooned uh, psycho manipulative experiments. Um, but also there's the jokey side to that where they just start to put stuff on chickens, sure. Um, but there's also the more serious side in which these ideas and conversations about the power to brainwash um, are part of the general emerging dominance of the psychological and behavioral sciences across the 20th century as a way of, again, establishing new forms of conjecture. And we're so fam familiar with this now. This is the BuzzFeed article or whatever that tells you, did you know that if your dish is larger, you eat more? Did you know that these three words can manipulate other people into agreeing with you in a conversation? So we're so attracted to certain ways of turning conjecture into power not certainty as power. And I think that's sort of the longer historical arc, Luke, that you key us into um, that I'm so grateful for. Um, so there's so much, I mean, I need to, I have like six hours worth of questions I need to ask you, but but I'll, I'll stop there and see, Luke, if you wanted to say more and then we can try and loop in some of the questions in the chat as well. Just two quick things. One, one is, I mean, you, you know, the book is is all is addressing the historical arc. I'm just thinking of, of the, you know, your, your, Referencing of Foucault's studies on 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 you know the clinic and and the kind right precisely this is this is a whole the creation of 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 truth through the kind of contest between the doctor and the and the individual um, as you point out in the book you know has become has become diffused and suffused into the kind of contests and relationships between the the designers of technology the technology itself and the individual and the, the person who's using it. Um, but just a very quick anecdote about Galton, which precisely operate, like points makes this point that it's it's really about which evidence is useful for the powerful when. Um, Galton, um, uh, Galt, one of Galton's dis disciples, Cottrell, you know, wrote a whole piece in an American psychological journal in the 1890s about you know the Galtonian method and these kind of this kind of kind of quasi scientific assessment of you know people how people you know people's traits. And then he asked Galton to write a kind of afterward. And, and Galton says in this afterward, well, you know, I find the most uh, the most accurate way of determining somebody is to really to like to like you know know them really well and to like kind of talk <laughs> to them and 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 then I I kind of then look at the numbers and if they match up then I trust the numbers. And you know, and it's kind of like, well, there you go, right? You know, statistics for me, but not for thee. Right. It's it's uh, right. If, if only we did yeah. that with everybody. But go on. Well, <laughs> right. Well, if only we could. Yeah. We have a couple of questions coming in from the chat, and uh, there's one long question from Vinit. You know, but uh, if you can just summarize, you know, can the presenters speak to the weakness of the available data uh, that's being collected and massive errors in predictions? Um, and um, and I have actually a follow up question that's related to that about how you know in social in the social sciences you know when we listen to computational social science scientists that are not in industry but let's say you know in academia or even in you know Microsoft Research for example when they talk about big data when they talk about computational uh, methods they they use the language of proxies of metrics. You know, they don't quite use the same language. So um, the charisma of numbers, you know, do you see that as a sector based, you know, formation? If uh, either of you could speak to that it would be great. Yeah, I, I can start and I think I can find a way to like Vinit brings up this question about the possible weaknesses or limitations of available data and how accurate these kinds of uh, 
uh, predictive models, iterative predictive models, and, and to an extent, uh, convolutional neural nets actually are. Um, but I think this is also related in some ways. I think I, I can get to Jacob's question about big data in the Canadian context. Um, and, and I'll invite Luke to jump in, jump in as well. Um, but for me, the key thing here is, and this is why I use the example of that person, Sami Osmakach, where you, we will never know if that person would have committed a terrorist attack on his own or not. But he was messed with in, to, a, to such an extent over like two years, I think it was, um, with people that he considered his only friends, basically, that it's just impossible to know. Right. And, and for me, that's a good example of not the same, but analogous kinds of limitations we see whenever these data sets travel out of the lab and actually try to make decisions about, do you stop this person at the airport? Do you fail this person? Did this person cheat as per the online proctoring? We see the hot mess that is. Um, with all of these actual consequential decisions, it comes back to what Luke said about Galton, where there's a realization that there is actually a certain irreducible into indeterminacy when it comes down to trying to talk about people's intentions or people's future trajectories, um, because you're the one locking that in, right? It's not the objective properties of the empirical world. That's not how statistics works. That doesn't lock people in. It is your decision to go back to this data and use that to make a decision about someone's future that locks them in into what you think they are right now. And I think that is not essentially a technical technological question that can be fixed with better models. Um, and that goes back to how these models are conjectural. And I think the danger going to Jacob's question um, is that these models are spreading incredibly quickly. The Citizens Lab has a new report on algorithmic policing in Canada. And it's just one example of how often these things are being taken up incredibly quickly in other countries, including a country that we think is supposed to be better than the US about this. It's just that sometimes we actually have less data because we focus on the US example, right? Um, and another example is how uh, the Xinjiang region acts as a test bed for Western corporations to use a lot of new surveillance technologies that will inevitably be used elsewhere. So I think that's the kind of, um, I think, I mean, I think people have different uh, ways of looking at this. My temptation, perhaps unfairly, is always to say, I'm not super interested in just talking about what's in the code. And perhaps I'm even sometimes saying some of the things that Luke points out in terms of how people are trying to do science or how people are trying to do the research, getting to Lena's question, how to process the data. Sometimes I'm not even super interested about that because for me, it is not the data that has something inside it that makes a knowledge claim to persuade us. It is people with a certain level of institutional power that decides to use the me it is the idea of the data is the medium. We use the data as a medium or itself as a proxy to instill our priorities and conjectures upon other people. And that's why I always step outside the data to focus on this, although there are limitations to that approach too. Yeah, I mean I I, I agree with, with all of that. And I think so, you know, one so you know, having having done a lot of work in the kind of AI ethics, quote unquote, space, right? I mean, the, you know, we often say to engineers, you know, you have to consider the social context, right? But what we 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 actually maybe should be saying, and it just occurred to me during this conversation, right, is that is that you know that 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 you, you know design te technology technologies produce narration, and narration is preemption. Right, and and so and so the narratives that get built implicitly or by accident or whatever into into the kind of the design of the systems, that's what's doing the preemption. I mean, Donald McKenzie, you know, has this idea of, of an engine, not a camera, right? So even in kind of cases, seemingly kind of bloodless cases, like in, in like in like financial trading algorithms, right? And so it, it's all the worse when you're dealing with. Um, you know, I mean, that's a, that's an indirect proxy of human behavior. I mean, you're, you're even worse when you're dealing with with you know algorithms that are trying to, you know, diagnose schizophrenia or predict homelessness or all these kind of things, which are all totally you know are all active projects in, in the Canadian context. Um, Alina, to your point about the Christmas of numbers, I think the Christmas of numbers is a kind of a kind of a very you know overarching kind of idea that 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 you know that you know goes way back. I I, I don't think it's sectoral. I think it I think it um, 
uh, you know, is, you know, ha has distinguished science, tech, you know, techno science for a long time. And, and it's just kind of a convenient way of, of pointing to the fact that something that, that just has, just because you have quantification doesn't necessarily mean you have, you have, have, you know, you have good evidence for you have, you have truth. Um, so, um, you know, and I think, and I will say, I think the, the more careful the statistician or mathematician, the more they they talk about that. I I did my uh, my my first postdoc with um, a quantitative sociologist, and and uh, you know who who was a frankly a better statistician and better better with numbers than any computer scientist I've met, and and was, she was extraordinarily careful in in saying what you know what the results that she had produced could could claim. She said we can't say that. That's too general. Like we're saying this very narrow you no know, narrow result, and so. You know, some of the some of the problem is 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 marketing hype, right? Is is again the charisma of numbers circulating as a kind of as a kind of societal or social discourse that that um that takes the kind of narrow claims of of scientists and blows out of proportion. Just just super quickly there, it's also um, I just want to add it's just a, a meta question of what claims to knowledge we're prepared to accept, or we've become used to accepting, um, and so at this point the hype machine works. Because when somebody says AI uses numbers to uh, predict the future, we sort of sit there and nod and say, oh, okay, I guess that works. Um, Ian Hacking has an amazing anecdote from, I think it was the 1840s England, the decade might be wrong, but this is at a point where he says, uh, he basically says the world is teeming with numbers, new forms of statistical information about society are suddenly everywhere. And then he says not everybody was convinced and you could find a lot of people writing to newspapers and things like that and basically saying, Okay, you're telling me what happens at this kind of statistical level for a thousand or ten thousand people. Who cares? That doesn't tell me what I need to do. You told me that there's an eighty percent chance that people get a job if they do this. That doesn't tell me if I should do this or not. That's got nothing to do with it. Your stuff, your knowledge is useless. People pushed back on that, and it wasn't by the sheer power of the knowledge that it, that this mode of knowing won out, right? And so it gives us a window into how it could be different. Will 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 Derringer's book I just put in chat which is of, of the similar it looks at the at the similar the similar kind of period it's the same exactly the same the same thing. Yep, it's brilliant. Yep. I think like at, at this point, you know, Catherine's question about QAnon really makes sense, you know, in terms that, you know, that no, because I mean, if you think about it, what people are doing, they are, they are vernacularly, you know, using this conjectural science to, you know, basically um, give them a sense that what they're doing is is justified. So if you guys could, you know, speak to that, maybe uh, in, in, in any way that you can, if, if it makes sense to you. And, and on top of that, I actually have another like tiny question that <laughs> maybe, you know, if you guys are interested in engaging with, and it's about uh, public culture, right? So Luke said that, you know, that these are, you know, it's that technologies produce this narrative and that this narrative, you know, contributes to, to this, uh, these techniques of preemption, right? And I'm thinking here about Westworld, the latest season of Westworld, which has been slammed, okay? It was not reviewed well, but, you know, basically this is part of what public culture does, right? It's trying to offer this kind of narrative. And I'm wondering, you know, from your point of view, both of you uh, have written books, you know, you give talks in different kinds of venues. Like, do you think that this kind of narrative, you know, if you can even call it a counter narrative is um, doing anything, you know, that could be seen as productive? So your choice. Um, you want to go to Catherine's question or my question? Up to you. I mean, I can I, I can try and go to both, but um, I was laughing not because uh, I, I was laughing about the Q and on mention because I actually think that's totally true, um, and and this overlaps a bit with the piece I wrote this week for for a CIGI. But um, right, the Q and on is a is a moment where it tells you you can't talk to people about fact checking and doing more research and stuff like that, right? So Peter Slaughter Slaughterdike writes about cynicism and basically says, to be a cynic requires you to believe in everything else except the thing that you're cynical about. So e.g. you're a cynic about how liberals, uh, how democracy doesn't actually work because actually you care super hard about democracy and you're so disappointed that it doesn't do what it says. You can't be a cynic if you don't care and you never believe, right? Um, and I think of it similarly with the crisis of fact and research where 
it's this idea that you can only tell people to look at the fact and do the research if everything else is securely in place in terms of our information environment. If that's not, if people say, well, I went to this website that claims to be a news website and it's the Epoch Times, um, and they told me that the vaccines aren't real, what are you gonna tell them? The QAnon people do a ton of research. It's just that the research is unmoored from any reliable guarantee of the reliability of the information. So Francesca Tripodi's work talks about this and says, she observes a lot of these, uh, a, a certain community of hardcore conservatives and says, how do they come up with different opinions about politics from the from liberals or others, right? And the conclusion there is, they, it's not that they only listen to the conservative news. They listen to a lot of different news pieces and they come up with their own ideas. It's just that the way they analyze the information is very different from, let's say, a West Coast liberal. So, so for me, yes, it is part of that um, roiling disruption of the, the meta, meta security that we have around this is the kind of person that looks trustworthy to begin with. This is the kind of person that looks truthful to begin with. Um, and the cultural narratives um, that we traffic in do play a huge part in that. And I'm inspired there by Timothy Melly's work where he looks at how fictional narratives um, about surveillance have basically played the defining role in all of our consequential policy decisions and, and all of these other like serious business. And to the point that CIA was actually getting people to write novels in the mid century because they saw that as a legit way to influence the culture. Can't speak about Westworld though, because I haven't seen it. Um, so maybe I'll, Luke, have you seen it? <laughs> I, you know, I, I haven't. Um, I'll just say <laughs> three things quickly. I actually, I just put, I put um, a link to Francesca Tripodi's report that you've just described at the same time in the chat. So folks can look at it. Another nice, nice piece um, is Molly Soto's The Epiphenic Machine, which, which, you know, talks about this idea of epiphenia of like, of like an overabundance of pa finding patterns where there aren't any, right? Which I think, yeah, is, is the kind of, the kind of, um, you know the kind of end, kind of kind of toxic end state of conjecture. Um, but what I was just going to say was, I think um, so. I saw, as somebody who works on on mood and emotion, everything to me looks like a question of mood and emotion. But I was I was really struck by um, the quote um, Sankhoff that you from Mary Douglas looking, talking about 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 certainty as as institutionally grounded. And and I and I wonder about the relationship between institutions and mood, right? Because to me. Um, I think I think mood I think moods can be institutionalized, right? I think I think I think moods can be can be can be um, can be uh, you know uh, 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 pumped up or or tamped down. And I th and I think there's an there's an interesting set of thinking would probably take you into things like will take one into things like you know propaganda research about about the way that um, yeah you know that 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 mood as a kind of kind of grounding for social formation. Um, you know, has something to do with with the kind of the kind of desire, both the desire for certainty and the and the kind of the kind of search for and creation of particular mechanisms of certainty that we're talking about here. Um, and I think that that ties into to Molly, Molly's work, Molly Sutter's work, because she's you know making the point that the structure of the internet, um, you know, and the kind of the kind of structure of the hyperlink, ha, you know, kind of predisposes you to a kind of kind of connective uh, connection or, or 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 looking for patterns even if they don't necessarily exist. Um, anyway. Yeah, there's, there's such a long history of this where, again, I come back to this, like the dominance of the psychological and behavioral sciences yeah. as sort of a pop wave, like everyone is so familiar. So you can imagine an alternative world where people like behavioral science, that's some kind of weird esoteric thing that only PhDs do and we don't care about it. But that's not how it happened, right? It's become a thing where you can write best-selling books where people think about themselves as being nudged into different kinds of behavior. And they try to now engineer their own nudges through self-tracking technologies yeah. like the Pavlov, which gives you an electric shock to get you to stop smoking or to eat more healthily. Um, and so what we, we have so internalized this idea of how we work. And I think that is, um, and I think this gets a little bit at, at Devin's question, I think that, that that was in the middle there. Um, that I don't know if I can get into the full philosophical background of all this now, but I think the one thing I'll mention is, I think this is what I try to get at with this idea that I put it glibly as the good liberal subject. That I think um, as much as we talk about postmodernism and post-truth and all of these other things, I think we're still in a stage where we're pining after this romanticized ideal when 
things made sense, democracy made it work, liberalism worked, the market uh, was rational, the free, the invisible hand of the market worked, never mind that Adam Smith never advocated for that kind of perfectly invisible hand. Um, and part of that is this pining for the idea that we are also machines, we process information, we create certainty on the, by the, uh, on the basis of the numbers, and then we act that out. And the weirdest thing about the quantified self is that there's actually a difference here. Um, if you look at the early days of the quantified self in this technology, where it is Silicon Valley people who are super tech savvy, they've got a lot of money, they've got a lot of flexibility in their work. So they've been doing like two hour runs in the middle of the day anyway for their startup. And so what, what they have is the knowledge and the level of control and the tech ability to say, I'm gonna use these tools to measure my galvanic skin response and things like that, but I'm not gonna let it take over me. I have the power to fiddle with my own tool and to update the models and look inside and see what happens. And so they really believed in maintaining this kind of holistic quality. It's that Galton thing. I wanna to talk to myself as well as use this data. But when this becomes a mass market product like Fitbit, and then when you're not buying the Fitbit anymore, but your company's giving you the Fitbit, places like BP America have been doing this, then it's a totally different situation where you lose all that, right? So, so, yeah. so. <laughs> I, 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 no, well, I just, I just wanna, I wanna just, I didn't answer, Alina, your, your question about the counter narrative. And, you know, I think um, where I've seen the counter narrative work, you know, it's, it's really grounded in, um, and this isn't and this isn't valorizing non-digital community because of course many of these communities organize via digital spaces and digital tools. But it's, you know, it's 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 grounded in. Um, I mean, it's grounded in. So I, I was um, hosting an event earlier today with Tawana Petty, who's um, you know a Detroit social justice activist. Uh, she's now the national organizing director for Black Lives uh, Data for Black Lives, right? And so and so this is you know a narrative that involves going and like you know and, and and talking to people and pointing out the dangers of, of these systems in their lives and and kind of winning them over and, and again that's not valid I, I mean i think right you know that's it's 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 maybe it's not exactly the liberal subject because it's it's um you know in detroit where tawana petty works you know these are sub you know these are 80 percent black city that's been that's been really um crapped on by the liberal subject so so i think yeah, I think that that kind of that kind of community activism does potentially have a have um, have power, but I mean it's it's hard. It's hard. It's labor. It's hard work, right? I mean, the the it, it's it's a lot of effort. Um, and it's a challenge, but it's certainly happening now much more than it was, uh, you know, five to eight years ago, right? I mean, it, it is kind of remarkable how much the the social conversation has shifted. I mean, the the social dilemma would never have been made five years ago, I don't think, or if it had been, it wouldn't have been a big hit. Yes. Yeah. Right, and you know, we're, we're coming up to, you know, almost at the end of, um, of our session. It's uh, an hour and a half and we can continue this conversation. Um, if, if any of you have, have any concluding thoughts um, and then maybe we'll try and wrap up. Yeah, I mean, so I'm just, I'm just thinking about, I mean, there's, there's so many things that I could say here, but I guess um, I'll, I'll end by highlighting one thing, which is, so following up on that, what you said, Luke, which is, I think, yeah, it's a lot easier to believe in this idea of the good liberal subject. Um, if we're looking at it from a top down perspective, well, we're listening to the people who are talking about this from a top down perspective. The moment that we talk to people who have gone through these systems on the other end, right? So people like Virginia Eubanks' book, where she looks at how the allocation of uh, like, like the detection of child abuse actually works at the county level in, in Pennsylvania, um, or Asia Bandawi's new documentary, where she talks about her experience of her entire neighborhood thinking they were all crazy and paranoid because they thought the CIA or the FBI was watching them. And then it turned out that they actually were watching them um, as part of this kind of misguided uh, suspicion of the most predominantly Muslim community. So I think when we start to listen to those other voices, um, which I try to do a little bit in that book, uh, but I don't do enough. And I try to do more in my current work now. 
I think it makes it, you know, it, it's actually so much easier for us to then get step outside that and understand that. So I think on one hand, it is about critiquing these ideas about objectivity, predictivity, and these promises of basically, I would call it like this kind of clean, smooth, sanitized world. And it's kind of like that background you have there, Luke, right? It's this idea of, it's, it's part of the technological aesthetic. Everything is clean. Everything is instant. There is no friction. It's all convenient. The food just appears on your doorstep. Um, and we have, we are always asked to just lean into that, right? And I think the biggest challenge that we have, and maybe the most obvious thing, but the biggest challenge we have with all of this kind of critical work and activist work is to say, no, remember that when you make something clean and, and smooth for you, you are taking real people's lives and justice for real people. And you're basically shoving that away into some dark corner behind the code saying, I don't want to look at it. I think that's another way to think about what actually happens behind the smooth surface of the screen. I think, I mean, I think that's, that's absolutely right. So someone is always washing the windows, right? If, if the windows look, look clean and shiny, there's somebody taking care of them. Um, no, I, I, I don't think, I don't think there's, there's, we could end on a, in a, in a better point than that somehow. So, um, yeah, thank, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to, to be able to, to engage in such depth with the book and, and with you. And, um, I'm, yeah, I'm really thrilled. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. And thank you, everybody. Um, folks who had to leave early, but also folks who stuck, stuck around. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and if we could all give, you know, uh, Sunha and Luke, you know, like a little emoji round of applause would be yeah. really great. Thank you for sticking <laughs> around. Apologies for going over time, but, you know, this conversation just, you know, led us to this place. So thank you all. Uh, I think the book and speaker series will continue. I'm standing in today for Svetlana. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks. Thanks you all for this great conversation. All right. Thank great. you so thank much. Thank you. Okay.